Good morning, and welcome to Bonanza Community Church's COVID Resurrection Sunday service. We want to welcome you as, our, as part of our community and friends. And we ask that you join with us in a spirit of real joy and love as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Today, we want to make a couple of announcements. First of all, as you know, Pastor Willem has moved on and resigned, and we are here today to let you know that uh, Pastor Russ, who was a former pastor, and myself, who's an elder, are ready and willing to function temporarily as uh, in the pastoral ministry uh, with you folks. If you need prayer, if you need uh, somebody to talk to, we would love to have you uh, converse with us. But even more than that, we would love to have you converse with one another. Because cr the Christian church, Bonanza Community Church, is a community, it's a family. And families share burdens and families share things. So let's join together as we progress through this time of COVID-19 and support one another. It can be a real testimony to the Christ we serve and the quality of the Christianity this church possesses. This morning, as we begin, we have something special, a special number by Bryn and by Doug for us as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Good morning again. Today we'd like to share with you 
a message of why Jesus had to die. And it's interesting in the fact that it encompasses the entirety of the scriptures. Our key scriptures begin at the very beginning, and they wind up at the very end of the scriptures. I want you to concentrate on that question in light of what the Bible says, because the entire Bible hinges on our need of the cross. That need goes back all the way to Genesis 3 when sin entered into the world. And it actually culminates all the way down in Revelation 21 when a new heaven and new earth are described. If you have a Bible this morning at home, turn with me to Genesis 3, 18 to 15 and we'll kick this Resurrection Sunday celebration off by looking back to where it all started. But the Lord God called man and said unto him, Where are you? And man said, I heard your sound in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman who you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you've done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And this is the key verse. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. It was in this way that sin came into the creation through the fall of Adam and the fall of Eve. Sin corrupted God's perfect creation. That's the first thing we want to remember as to why Jesus had to die. God always intended to have a perfectly mutually loving relationship with his people. It's no coincidence that when God made Adam and Eve, he said his creation was not merely good, but very good. And the Hebrew there takes on the force of, he was saying in a way, it was excellent. After an Adam and Eve's sin, everything changed. The rest of the scripture focuses on what God did to reconcile the world to himself and make it perfect once again. So sin corrupted God's creation. The second thing is that the law could not heal our brokenness from sin. God in his mercy, he revealed his law to people over several hundred years. We think of the law as the Ten Commandments, but in the Old Testament we actually find 613. Now, 603 of these are practical examples and applications that grow out of the actual Ten Commandments. If you want to look them up, they're in Exodus 20. These laws told the Israelites what they should do to live a life that honored God. When the Israelites sinned, they had to repent and sacrifice for what they'd done. Sin always costs something. However, it was not merely enough to live in an upright life and avoid doing evil deeds. Romans 3.20 says, For by the works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And Jesus said in Matthew 3.20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The question is, what does he mean by exceeding the righteousness of the Pharisees? 
It means, ladies and gentlemen, that there is no amount of inherent goodness that we can perform that can make us acceptable to God because we have the Adamic sin nature at the core of our being. And unless that nature is eradicated, anything we do in our strength is futile. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We have all become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment, or as the old King James says, as filthy rags. So when sin entered into the world, it caused death and decay, and the law makes us aware of our sin by showing us our symptoms. It shows us our symptoms, but it cannot give us a cure. Paul says in Romans 6.23 that the consequences or wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Our rebellion against God earns death, someone's death. But the good news of Resurrection Sunday is that that death does not have to be our own. We need to have a means to eradicate the sin nature as well as our sins. And this is why Jesus, who was sinless, could die in our place. If I were to die for anybody, it wouldn't do any good because I'm in the same predicament. I can't take the wrath of God for anybody else, just me. But Jesus, His pure and unblemished Son, was in such a position. When Jesus sacrificed Himself for our sin, God paid the penalty for our transgressions. The old verse that we quote so frequently, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life speaks volumes. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then it goes on to say, And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance, His looking over, He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so <clears throat> as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus was in a position to redeem us because He lived a sinless life and had no sin nature. He took our sin and when it was laid upon Him on the cross, you know what He did? He multiplied it by zero. He multiplied it by zero. Now those of you that are mathematicians, what happens when you multiply any number by zero? What's the result? Oh boy. And if we accept His work on Calvary and His bodily resurrection by faith, we can receive newness of life and we stand before God in the righteousness of Christ. And what does God see when He looks at us in terms of sin? He sees zero. Bless God. He sees zero. Nothing. We stand in the righteousness of Christ. That's a comfort. You know, as we stand in His righteousness, we can work all our lives to try to be better. And we should try to conform to God's will. But in the sight of God, we will never be any better. We can't be any better. Because when He sees us, He sees the righteousness of His Son. more than this all through the history of the Bible there is a plan that Satan had to try to toss what Jesus was going to do 1 John 3 8 says the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning since the beginning since before Adam and Eve 
The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And this is where it becomes interesting and ironic. You know, it's interesting how God, <laughs> how God fooled Satan. Satan thought he was really something. If you look in the Old Testament in Isaiah, you have the five I wills. I will ascend into the heights. I will be like the Most High. Now, I haven't given all five of them, but I can tell you that was on his lips. And boy, is he going to be bought down low. For the wisdom, it says in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, For the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age have understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The fact that Jesus was crucified played right into the hands of God, and he used Satan to do it. Imagine that. There are more things going on in our universe above us and underneath us in the spirit world surrounding us than we can imagine. God is always at work. The hosts of heaven are constantly serving him in ways that we can only begin to imagine. Hebrews 1, 7 and 14. But so is his arch enemy at work along with all of his imps and minions that we call demons. We see this in Scripture. We see examples. Look at Job 1.12 and um, 2 Thessalonians 2.8 and 9. Bear in mind that Satan is the enemy of all that is good. Anything that would benefit mankind and bless God's creation, he works to undermine and to weaken. But God... Praise his name is not stammied by Satan. God doesn't lose sleep over what Satan is doing. Satan's doom is settled and his fate is sealed. His days are numbered according to Revelation 20, 14 and 15. The great reformer Martin Luther said in a song, On earth is not his equal. We are no match for Satan, it's true. But through Christ, we can be more than conquerors. God is constantly, and through the Bible, He constantly hands the devil defeat after defeat after defeat. Let's look at the one case in point. Let's look back to when Jesus was born. You know, you can't separate Easter from Christmas. Okay, you can't do that. Satan did not know what God was up to. First of all, understand, you've got to understand about Satan that he's a created being. Ezekiel 28, 11 to 17 and Isaiah 14, 10 to 27 demonstrate that. He shares none of the attributes or the characteristics of Almighty God. Satan is not omniscient. Satan is not omnipresent. Satan is not omnipotent. He's limited in his knowledge. He's limited in where he can be. And he's limited in his power. And when it comes to predicting what God is going to do next, he must rely on what he can figure out. Same as you and I. What he remembers from the timeless past when he resided in heaven as a favorite angel and what he reads in Holy Scripture. Since the Holy Spirit does not enlighten his understanding, he sees the world, he sees as man sees it, as fallen man sees it, and he doesn't see it with the mind of Christ. Once we understand this, the puzzle pieces fall into place. Satan was fooled. The Apostle Paul pointed out that the enemy known, had known of what God was up to, he would never have crucified Jesus. He mentions this in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 8. Satan was often fooled other times in Scripture. Sometimes in biblical history, we see that the Lord manipulated Satan as in the case of Job and also in the case of Joseph. Sometimes God gave him a good comeuppance as in Mount Carmel with Elijah and the prophets Baal in a fire-calling contest. 
At other times, the Lord used subterfuge to fool his enemy. Esther 6, 7 and 8. Christmas. His birth was also one of those times. What Satan knew of the birth of the Messiah can be read. He knew from Micah 5.2 that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. What he didn't know was the timing of the Savior's birth. So in another of his endless efforts to thwart the purposes of God, Satan pulled in demons from all over <laughs> around the world to concentrate on the Holy Land and specifically the region around Bethlehem. I have a sneaking hunch that that's one of the reasons why in the, when Christ was an adult, <laughs> you see all of this demonic activity going on there. I think it's a result of that. Satan was lying in wait for the Messiah. So God fooled Satan. <laughs> the first thing God did was to choose a man and a woman. Not from Bethlehem, but from Nazareth, far to the north. Secondly, he saw to it that the woman's purity and morality would be doubted. If you don't believe me, just look at Matthew 8, 1, 18 to 24. The devil can count. He knows it takes nine months to make a baby. He had no way of knowing Gabriel's visit to Mary and Joseph or of the miraculous conception of the baby. If he heard at all of this young Nazarene couple, he would have quickly discounted them. Certain that the God he remembered from heaven would never deign to be so obvious in his use of sinners for such a holy role. Then God slipped the Holy Family into Bethlehem. The third thing God did, He arranged to move Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem at the time of the birth, but not so as to draw attention to themselves. When Caesar Augustus put out a call for the census of the empire, God had put it in His heart. Proverbs 21.1 says the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. And he turns it wherever he wishes. Mary and Joseph were among the thousands returning to their ancestral homes for the census. And perhaps the roads experienced some sort of, of uh, primitive gridlock. With Bethlehem's inns and available homes filled, the young couple took the only thing they could, and that was a stable. And she brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger, and there, because there was no room in the inn. If the devil's imps were vigilant, they would have dismissed the young family camping out in the barn for good reason. The fourth thing is Satan couldn't find the baby Jesus. God, whom Satan remembered from heaven, <coughs> resided in a level of glory unimagined on earth. Satan was unsure of a lot of things, but one thing he thought he knew. God in heaven would not allow his son to be born in a barn. Doubtless Satan had told his demons to check the finest homes for the most illustrious surroundings and outstanding parents. But the Lord fooled him. God has chosen the foolish things, it says in 1 Corinthians 1.27. The foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And this is a basic lesson in spiritual warfare, which historically Satan seems incapable of grasping. And to this day, neither can any carnal mind. Satan's eyes were also blinded. When Jesus was born, God prepared a welcoming committee of the lowest people, the lowliest on the planet, shepherds. Primarily to reassure young parents that all was well, Satan had no way of seeing the angels that appeared to these sheep or shepherds that night or hearing their clues on how to identify the baby. Luke said, And this shall be a sign unto you, you will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. No one noticed or cared when a small company of ragtag shepherds ran breathlessly through a village for looking for what else? A stable. Later, after Joseph had moved his little family into a house in Bethlehem, a delegation of foreign visitors arrived. These magi arrived from the east, and they created no small stir in Jerusalem as they naively announced their search for the one-born king of the Jews. 
Matthew 2, 13 to 23. From the gifts they presented, Joseph was able to finance a sudden trip to Egypt, made necessary by the, when the murderous King Herod sent his soldiers on a search and destroy mission for the babies of Bethlehem and beyond. Matthew 2, 8 says that what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Satan would have fumed to learn that the objects of his wrath were already out of town, slowly making their way towards Egypt where they would remain until Herod's death. Eventually, the Holy Family re-entered the country and moved to Nazareth, where Joseph opened a carpenter shop. Satan had lost Jesus. He came so close. We had him in Bethlehem. He must have said to his demonic staff, and we let him slip through our fingers. Curses! Curses! Jesus then grew up with a normal childhood in Nazareth. He was not Superboy in Smallville, amazing hometown folks with miracles and inspired teaching. He had done that. Had he done that, Satan would have heard about the talk of the boy wonder and come calling. First time Jesus learned of his learned of Jesus' identity was the day the Lord stepped into the waters of the Jordan waited out to John the baptizer and nudged by the Holy Spirit John called out behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and now everybody had learned that the Messiah was Jesus of Nazareth Jesus baptism was his coming out the gloves were off God in heaven was saying there he is devil do your worst we're ready the game was afoot and the battle was joined. It came to head one day, three years later, on a hillside out of Jerusalem. And for a couple of days, Satan reveled in his victory. And the wine and the champagne of hell flowed freely. Then on that first resurrection Sunday morning, one of Satan's imps rushed into the presence of his satanic majesty and interrupted the two-day celebration over the death of Jesus. And the demon said, Master, Master, breathlessly announcing that the tomb was empty, the body gone, the soldiers thought they'd seen a ghost. Satan spewed out his champagne and threw the glass against the wall and must have cursed. He had been had and he knew it. He played right into God's hands and he was defeated and beaten again. But the imp continued. He even preached a sermon in Hades. It says in 1 Peter 3, 18-20, for Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. Satan asked his imp, what did he say? And I can imagine the imp probably sputtering and, and, and saying something to the effect that Jesus preached redemption is now accomplished and all those who were in paradise from the Old Testament days awaiting the crucifixion of God, he led captivity captive and he released them. He emptied paradise master. They're gone. And he's carried them to heaven. And Jesus, on that morning, he welcomed those righteous ones from the Old Testament, wishing them a blessed eternity. But he also gives us a glimpse of what we have to look forward to. And we find that in Revelation 21, 1-6 
where he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. And neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain any more. For former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. And it is for this reason, on this day, we rejoice. And rejoice evermore. So what are the implications of Jesus' death? What are the implications of why he had to die? Well, there was a simple store clerk. <laughs> who lived in Independence, Oregon, of all places, which around the turn of the last century, about 1910, 1920, and her name was Myra Brooks Welch. She was active in her church, and she played organ, and she had a gift for words. As she grew older, arthritis crippled her hand, and eventually confined her to a wheelchair and they moved down to Laverne, California. She could no longer play her beloved organ or write with her hands but she could hold pencils in her hands and she could tap keys on the keyboard of a typewriter. And out of that pain and physical limitation, she composed these words as a testimony to her Redeemer and to what the power of the Redeemer is all about. We know her poem as the great poem, The Touch of the Master's Hand. And it goes like this. Was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to spend much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks? He cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar? A dollar. Then two, only two. Two dollars, and who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice. Going for three? But no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow, then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening all the strings. He played a melody, pure and sweet, as caroling angels sing. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, What am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars! And who'll make it two? Two thousand! Who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them cried. We do not quite understand. What changed its worth? And the man replied, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd much like that old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once. He's going twice. He's going, and he's almost gone. 
But the master comes and the foolish crowd can never quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Ladies and gentlemen, there is absolutely nothing you can do to earn your salvation. There is absolutely nothing you can do to be acceptable to God save one thing, and that is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Put your faith and trust in Him for whom Resurrection Sunday is all about. If you need forgiveness, if you need the presence and the peace of Jesus this Resurrection Sunday, I pray that you would bow your head at home or call somebody and ask them to pray with you and ask the God of the universe a simple prayer saying that you realize that you have a sin nature and that in your own strength we're nothing but filthy garments. But that you want to be clean. You want to be washed. You want your sins to be multiplied by zero and stand before Him in His righteousness. Ask God to forgive you and become Lord of your life. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your resurrection. And thank you for the joy we can experience as we worship together. And even though, Father, we are apart, we know that this will pass. And we look forward to that day when every tear will be wiped away and there will be no death as we sing in your presence the song of Moses and the Lamb. Give us your grace throughout this week and your wisdom. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen again to Doug and Bryn as they close our service with a song in Christ alone. my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me 
For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hands till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand